Because there is none that we can liken unto you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end of all things. You are worthy to receive all the glory, honor, and power. For you have created all things for your pleasure they are and were created. And so we say yours is the kingdom, Lord. Yours is the power. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we we'll give you all the praise. Let's be seated. God bless you guys. That was excellent. That was fantastic. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Oh, your sins, the kingdom forever. Hallelujah. Yes, yours is the kingdom, Lord. Yours is the power, Lord. Yours is the glory, Lord. Forever and evermore. Father, we worship your holy name. We live to praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Alrighty. All right, all right, all right. I saw a couple of people just kind of like heading out. If there's a situation, maybe they're trying to get their children into the classrooms, encourage them to hurry back because I don't want them to miss a thing. Let me ask you, have you thought about the testimonies from Tuesday? I mean, sorry, from Saturday. Here, you know, Saturday, we had testimonies on Saturday, didn't we? Okay, we're going to ask somebody else. Manuelita doesn't know what day is it. It is. Uh, Gavin, is it Tuesday today? Okay. Yeah, so Saturday. Yeah. Thank God for the testimonies and... Um, there was such a sweet spirit in this place. After the service on Saturday, you know, there was such a Holy Spirit presence here. We were shouting and giving praise to God. And one person who was here for the first time was right there and Alan was praying with him and he just broke out in tongues and he spoke in tongues for the very first time. Filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe his name was Christian. Not yours, Christian. This one is with a C. Because that Christian with a K, we need to baptize him in water and change it to a Christian with a C. Uh, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. I can say that because he's not here. And Emmanuel is not a snitch, so I'm good. Alrighty, God is good. But that is the beauty of it. The beauty of it is knowing that the Holy Spirit is here and we are not just saying he's here. We have very tangible evidences of the Holy Spirit being here. Ma'am, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you're coming for the first time, I want you to get that stuff firsthand. So if you don't mind coming closer here, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. So um, this is premium seating right here. So you can sit next to Shayla if you want to. Okay, all righty. That's good, that's good. At least closer than where you were, I'll take that. Praise God. Alrighty, so um, tonight by the grace of God, um, I got a couple of announcements to make. And um, you know, the word of God says, let him who stand to speak, speak as an oracle of God. And um, I stand here today as an advocate on behalf of the host of heaven concerning certain things that have become paramount. Um, and in fact, I, I believe critical actually. And so 
the announcements I'm making, uh, they have to do with the things that I have a privilege to in the realm of the spirit. There is such an outcry amongst the angels when it comes to the lack of attentiveness to what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the churches. Many of us have yet to cultivate that potent and dynamic attentiveness what the pe what um, I think it's in the field of psychology we we'll call it acute attentiveness wherein you intentionally allow yourself to pick up on the things that are going on around you in the places that matter the world has taught us to pay attention to things that matter to them which are mostly detrimental to us because the Bible says that friendship with the world is enmity against God and to be carnally minded is death whereas to be spiritually minded is life and peace and so I have been privileged to hear a conversation amongst the host of heaven which is my place and your place the Bible says that we have not come to a mountain that might be touched unto blackness unto darkness unto tempest which is describing the experience that the children of Israel had at Sinai or Sinai wherein it was a physical mountain but all they could remember was the blackness and the tempest and the torment but the Bible says that we have come to the company of innumerable angels and we are gathered assembled the spirit of just men made perfect and you know my take on that is that we may just we may be just men, but we have been made perfect. And so when we are in the company of innumerable angels, should we not have, Emmanuel, something to show for it? Should it not be apparent in the lives that we live and the confidence with which we approach the things of destiny that we actually hear what is being said in the company of innumerable angels? And I know that when we were growing up, we were told that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that it is not all about speaking in the tongues of angels, that it is about charity, that it is about love. But I tell you, it is about love primarily, yes, but there is a reason why we also need to be conversant with what the Holy Spirit is saying and what the host of heaven are saying. Because there's a reason why we are in their company. There's a reason why the Bible says the Lord has given his angels as ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. If you do not hear what they are saying, how do they minister to you? It's one thing for them not to talk, to just guide you, but I know they speak. Every time you hear of the messenger of the Lord in the Bible, they would come with a word from the Lord and the word of the Lord came from, uh, came through the angel Gabriel to Joseph, to Zechariah, to Mary. It, the word of the Lord keeps coming through the mouth of many angels. When Jesus was to, be, was to be born, the Bible says there was a crowd, there was a crowd of angels and they were chanting to gather joy to the world. The Lord has come. How can it be that such a privilege is available to you and I and yet we have lost the art of being attentive to what has been said in the realm of the ones that have been appointed to see us through. Let us turn in our Bibles very quickly to the book of Zechariah. We will read the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Holy Ghost. Mambro Kushti Zaflande Digeda Brodos Kutolo Dorigeda Barantis Mituli Vedaya. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3, I meant to say. Zechariah chapter 14. Actually, let's first of all read verse 22. I mean, verse 7. And then we'll come back to verse 3. It says, it shall be one day. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. Now let's read verse 3. Verse 3 says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day 
of battle. Verse 6 says, It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light, the lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. I'm reading this to you because of the fact that we are being shown and been reminded that the day of the Lord is fast approaching. The Lord himself is coming to do battle. And when he comes to do battle, he says, I'm going to take care of those nations, the concomitances of evil forces. They're not yours to fight. The reason why they seem to have become more powerful than you can deal with. The reason why they have attained so much prominence, says the Lord, is because the Lord is setting them up for destruction. I know that many of us, whether we say it or not, we think it. We wonder how come evil has become so powerful in the world. We think about how much different our lives will be without the forces of darkness. Without the activities of the children of disobedience. Without the activities and the operations of the oppressors. Do you not wonder what life would be like if they would seize their torment? If they will seize and deceased. And you're like, how did God even let them get this far? Such that wherever you turn, almost every channel that you can watch on television has been bought and taken over by those who are functioning in the spirit of the false prophet, creating and furthering the agenda of darkness. You wonder how come a system that was portrayed to be for the people, by the people, has now become one that holds the people hostage. Continuing to present itself as God by being unquestionable. When you question what they do today, the ones who have committed themselves to nothing but the oppression of the poor, guess what happens? You, 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 you see that they are committed to nothing but the oppression of the poor and yet it seems like they continue to have the power and the resources to get it done. But you know, many times rather than us wondering, we can just look at what's already happened. Because Solomon says there is nothing new under the heavens. He says what is has always been, and what will be is what is. And so we know that some, at some point, the Lord had allowed for a system to grow and become so potent, so to speak, only for them to be destroyed. Remember the story of Pharaoh, right? The very first Pharaoh, which you will find in the book of Yasher, the very first Pharaoh was a man who decided to exploit everybody else to become very wealthy and powerful. And that was how he became Pharaoh. The title Pharaoh in its definition and meaning has got to do with someone who uses his authority to oppress. To take advantage of. And we don't even have to wonder if that was only a coincidence. Because you saw that from Pharaoh to Pharaoh, the spirit of the oppressor was never wanting. You just have to look at their decrees. You just have to look at their posture. And you can see. And someone says, so what about the Pharaoh? That was Pharaoh when, when Joseph was prime minister. 
that Pharaoh that was Pharaoh when Joseph was prime minister was not just an oppressor, but he was a very serious oppressor. And you're like, how come? Where are you getting your information from? It's in your Bible that he enslaved his own people. After they consumed all of the food that they stored that they could eat, they used all of their money to buy food from their king to the point wherein they had no more money and they all went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, we have spent all of our money buying grain, but that we may live and that our children may live to bury us. Take us as your servants and we will be your slaves for as long as we can eat. They sold themselves to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh did not say, oh, you're my citizens and um, I, I can't take credit for having food. He was all a vision from God. And thank God for this prophet Joseph who was instrumental, uh, you know, in interpreting the dream. So please have free food. No, he took their commitment and he became, and they became his slaves. So it wasn't just the children of Israel that ended up becoming slaves. Even his own people started to pay tax. His own people became slaves. His own people started to work for him. And that is the reason why they could not be kind to the Israelites because even they themselves are oppressed. Because you know why? What you have is what you give. And so when you have a lot of oppression, guess what you give? You give a lot of oppression. That has been the story of Pharaoh's and God continued to allow it to be because of the fact that he knew that as long as man sees the other man as opposition, he will not attempt to fight God. Let me say that again very slowly and I'll prove it to you. You see, if I think that I can take on anybody in this room, and if I think that I may not be able to take rather, some people in this room, my homework will be to train and to investigate and to do research for how I would be able to take on the biggest man in the room. You know, I may look at Alan and say, yeah, I can push him down. And then I look at Kenyatta and I'm like, uh, no. So what do I do? I got to pick up more weight because that is my target. I've not been able to overcome him. But the moment I've overcome every person that is here, I would seek even a higher challenge. And so man, under the authority, or I should say man, under the um, service or in the service of Satan, behaves like that. The moment man feels like he has conquered every man, then he challenges God. And that is exactly what God's been waiting for. God was waiting for Pharaoh to challenge him. And initially, excuse me, Pharaoh was not. Pharaoh was focused on Moses and Aaron. He was like, I can deal with these guys. In fact, initially, he didn't even give them any time of day. When Moses and Aaron showed up, he summoned Janis and Jambres. And it's like, these two, what did you just do? Your rod became a serpent? Boys, you've been eating free food in Pharaoh's palace for so long. Come and do something. And they also turned their rods to serpents. I know that it's not in Genesis or in Exodus, their names, but you'll find it, I believe, in, uh, in, in one of the epistles of Paul, perhaps Timothy, and you wonder where Paul got it from. He must have gotten it from the book of Yasher because that's the only book that we know of that contains the details of what happened in the palace of Pharaoh, including the names of the magicians. So Janice or Yanis and Jambres came and they were the ones who opposed Moses and Aaron. Pharaoh felt like they're not a match for me just yet. But the moment they overcame his goons, he was like, okay, so now they are at my level. I can deal with them. And you know what he said? He says, I am not letting your people go. What are you going to do? What happened? Moses and Aaron, they left the presence of Pharaoh and they went away. And so Pharaoh was still dealing with a man. But guess what happened? The moment Pharaoh recognized that, okay, these people are not able to leave unless I say to leave, what is my next challenge? The Bible says the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Do you know that after a while, Pharaoh was like, okay, okay, okay. 
I'm going to let you go only for three day, days because that was what they asked for. They were being strategic, right? They asked for three days. They were being strategic, but because of the fact that the call of God was upon the life of Moses, they were being prophetic, all right? Because they said, oh, we're just going to go three days journey, right? They were being strate strategic because they thought if we told Pharaoh we're going forever, he's not going to let us go. So they said three days, but they were being prophetic because the Bible says in two days, I will prepare my people and on the third, they will meet with me for I shall receive them. And so when they said they were going three days, they were prophesying because everything that happened to the children of Israel at Exodus is a type of what will happen to the body of Christ at the next Exodus. And so going back to what happened to Pharaoh, Pharaoh was already given in to the request of Moses and Aaron. And suddenly the Lord hardened his heart. And the Lord said to Moses, you know the reason why I did it? He said, I did it because I have not had a chance to throw a punch just yet. He said, because my commitment to Abraham was that I would save his children by my outstretched arm. And so if the battle is still between you and Aaron and, and Pharaoh, you haven't brought me into the ring. How many people remember the days when we still watched wrestling thinking that it was real? And if this is the first time you're hearing that wrestling is not real, you're welcome. And they call that thing, what do they call it? The tag team. So you have the big gun waiting outside. They send the little one first to just taste the blows. And then when he cannot handle it anymore, you know, he scrambles to get to the end and just tags and then suddenly one crazy fellow comes in and starts jumping and pulling ropes and, and running back and forth and leaning and doing all that gymnastics. And then we will be there screaming so much that we would even get into trouble. Remember? And that is exactly what happened. Moses had to tag God in. And God was like, as long as Pharaoh is winning, you know, I mean, as long as you are winning, rather, you're not going to call for me to come in. But the moment Pharaoh starts winning, guess what? He would want to take on the man behind the rope. And that was what happened. God had an opportunity eventually because Pharaoh gave in to God's invitation to choose the hardness of heart. Now, let me tell you this. God is very consistent. When the Bible says the Lord hardens the heart of Pharaoh, we know the way God hardens people's hearts. We know. How does God harden the heart of a man? God will give you an option to choose whether you want to bow before him or you want to stand as God on your own. When the Bible says the Lord hardens the heart of Pharaoh, Pharaoh had an opportunity to have said, ah, no, thank you. I choose to not fight God. Please go. But he saw an opportunity to stand as God and he took it. It is very important for us to know that because if you don't understand that, you would think that, oh, why did God set the guy up like that? Come on, that wasn't fair. No, God in his fairness always sets before each and every one of us life and death. And he also tells us what to choose just in case we don't know. But we knew that Pharaoh chose hardness of heart. And so guess what happened? God had an opportunity to come in and to deal a blow. I say this because many of us are not praying as we should simply because we do not believe anymore that there is a point or that there is any hope, to be honest. Now, you may be thinking in your mind, of course, I still believe there is hope. I believe in the power of God. But I'm talking about subconsciously because we have been so bombarded with all kinds of things. We have experienced so much defeat that after a while, subconsciously, we are not praying as we ought to because it's like there's no amount of prayer that I say that is going to stop the IRS from coming to get their money. There is no amount of prayer that I say that can actually allow for me to own that which my father says is mine. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But the reality of it is that even when you say that you have bought that piece of land, it's still not yours because for as long as you live, you have to keep pay paying taxes on it. The reality of it is that we are in a system that is not too different from when the children of Israel were in Egypt. It is the reality of it 
whether we like to admit it or not, the Bible says that the Lord is coming to redeem his people. If we have already been free, why do we need redemption? The Bible says whom the son says free is free indeed. Free to what? Free to have hope of redemption. So I tell you what, when you think about it, the system in so many ways. Now let me dial back one step. Okay, let me dial back because I don't want to be misunderstood when I'm talking about the system, the system, the system. All right? The system of Egypt was originally designed by God to preserve his people. Without Egypt, there would have been no people. Because when they did not make sufficient plans for what the world was becoming, they were too concerned and consumed with their own internal family politics. Remember that Esau and Jacob had an opportunity to have carried on the dynasty of Isaac. Because Isaac inherited everything from Abraham because there was no other sibling to struggle with him. Abraham had foresight and he already sent off Ishmael. And Ishmael had his own problems. He couldn't get a good wife. Almost every wife that he married was trouble until finally he found one. But by then he was already a tired man. But Isaac, on the other hand, had nobody struggling with him. So everything that he had was supposed to have just been carried on by, Isaac, by Esau and Jacob. But they couldn't stop fighting each other. And that is the reason why by the time the world was beginning to evolve, they were not ready. They needed Pharaoh to take them in for a little while. So that system was designed using heaven's intelligence before it could be functional. Remember that even Egypt itself survived by the wisdom of God. All right? Because when they asked Joseph what to expect of his God, what did he say? He said, my God will give you an answer of peace. Peace is God's definition of how the world should be. And that is the reason why Egypt was able to be a place of safety by the wisdom of God. But let me tell you something. Any system that you see that exists for a while, serving people without acknowledging the author of the wisdom will eventually oppress the same people. Okay, because Egypt was doing just fine until the Bible says a Pharaoh came who did not know God nor his people. Does that make sense? And so when we're talking about the system, the system, I have been such a beneficiary of the system and so have all of us in this room. But what we say is that we know that there is no system that is championed by man that will take us into eternity because the Bible says the arm of flesh shall fail. I say what I say just to magnify the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming as the only system that can and give us the utopia that our heavenly father had in mind right from the beginning. I do not say that to demean anybody or to demean anyone's effort or any institution, but I say that in the context of this kingdom that we anticipate and I am contrasting what we expect against what we currently have. Alrighty, so I am not anti-system, but what I am is I am a witness and a proponent of the one that is to come. Okay? So when I say that, no matter what we do, we cannot change the system because the system itself has been hijacked and taken over by darkness for the purposes of the fulfillment of prophecy. You understand what I mean? Because there is something that God wants to do and there is the level of degeneration that needs to happen before he does it. Let us read that Zechariah again because I want us to get that preamble so that we can better understand what we read earlier on. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 3. It says the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. 
How is God going to fight for us in this time? The way that he fights. Okay? The way God fights in the day of battle is the way that is going to fight again today. And how did he fight for the children of Israel against Pharaoh? Remember that the very last iteration of the system of Nimrod that will be in operation when Jesus comes in the blue sky is called what? It's called Egypt. The very last iteration of the system is called Egypt, but it is an unholy trinity because it is not just Egypt, it is also called Sodom, and it is not just Egypt and Sodom, but it is also called Babylon. Why is that? Because the glory of the latter has to surpass the former. If God says concerning his children and his administration on the earth that he will bring about a combination of the latter and the former reign, then you expect Satan to do exactly the same. And that is the reason why the three most successful systems of Nimrod or, or, or the kingdom of Satan are currently in operation today as the unholy trinity. So we have Egypt, we have Sodom, and we have Babylon. Now, how was Egypt destroyed? Egypt was destroyed because God took out Pharaoh. And his top guns, all the firstborn, were taken out and God destroyed his army. How was Sodom destroyed? By fire. And how was Babylon destroyed? The Lord came and he confused their language. We're seeing those three things in operation today. You understand what I mean? Because God is like... I'm doing it like I've always done it. What did I tell you about two years ago about Zechariah? I told you Zechariah 14 is a, is a prophecy to the church. So everything that you're seeing here is written for us. And it says, and God is saying, I am coming to destroy the nations and I will do it the way that I've always done it. And so if that is the way God does it, what am I to expect now? I am here to tell you what to expect. What we are to expect is that Pharaoh is not just happy being able to oppress us and keep the stakes high. He wants to pursue us. And so there are things that will begin to unfold. You see, I saw that the principalities are taking their leave from their meeting. The plans have been concluded they are swinging into execution. And so the moment I saw that, I knew that, okay, if they have met and now they're leaving, guess what's going to happen? They will begin to execute whatever it is that they were plotting. Even though we know by faith and the instruction of the word of God that everything that they have planned that appears very elaborate to them because you know that they have to believe it to attempt it. Let me say that again. They believe that they can overpower Jesus or that they can even possibly stop his coming. Because if they don't believe it, they're not going to be spending their time. These are eternal beings who have resources that we haven't even heard about. When I say we haven't heard about it, it's from the perspective of how they use it. Because all power has been given unto us through Jesus Christ. Okay, so don't be feeling second class to them. I'm just saying in the way that they apply it. But you see these folks... Their meeting after the angels met in the year 2020 into 2021, I kept seeing the meeting of the angels. The angels arrived first and there were so many regiments of them. We saw the ones that were the winter angels who were angels of warfare, who spoke like they were speaking some Cantonese language. We saw those and then we saw the strategic angels who were the innumerable company of angels who were in the tents of meeting where they were continuing to create an ambience of the fragrance of the Holy Spirit so that it will be amplified that which is being said, the spirit and the bride say Come. And we have had that privilege of seeing that and I've gotten to share that with you. But I also bring you an update today that the principalities have had their meetings and they're about to go into operation to execute their plans. But the word of God lets us know that the kings of the earth, they plot a vain thing. It is vain from God's perspective. But that doesn't mean they will not attempt to make our lives difficult. That doesn't mean that they will not attempt to sway many people in the direction of what? Of confusion. And that is the reason why there is so much bullying going on in the world today. Where in every single one of us, we are being made to bow to the agenda of rebellion. Because let me tell you something. They keep saying, oh, this is Pride Month or whatever they say it is. And you look at their symbol, 
And I keep telling you, please let every one of us be awake and know the things that we are seeing. They have six colors instead of seven. I, I want to encourage you, tell people, tell your children, tell your friends, tell them that look, the fact that this thing is six is good for you because now you know it's not of God. Because the Bible says that there are seven spirits of God. God is light. And whenever light passes through a prism, what does it become? It becomes seven colors. And we knew that when we were children, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Those are the seven colors. Because seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of the spirit of God. But six is the number of man. So when man makes himself the light, Jesus says, if the light in you be darkness, how deep is that darkness? You cannot have light from the combination of the six colors. The physics is not right. It is a symbol of rebellion. And that is the reason why the Bible says the mark of the beast is going to be 666. Because six is the number of man. It's there in Revelations. That number is the number of man. When man becomes the authority to himself, it doesn't matter what the creator made me. I have remade myself and I tell myself who I am. As opposed to listening to who the I am say that I am. You see, this is going on in the world and we tend to think it's just the times that we're in. But yes, the Bible lets us know that the antiques of the times that we're in are directly the function of the wickedness of that age. The Bible says, now let us put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand all of the fiery darts of the enemy that we may be able to twat all of the, all of the efforts of Satan. And by so doing, we will recognize that the ones that we are wrestling against are not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And what else? Against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Every age that we are in has a ruler. And the ruler of this age it's the one with the face of a man and the body of a woman. The ruler of this age is that mystery Babylon that sits on the beast, that whore of Babylon. In time past, she has had names such as Ishta, such as Inanna. They call her those names because she claims to be able to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man. We're dealing with the beast from the abyss. But I tell you one thing, we don't have to worry ourselves sick. All we need to do is just be confident that we have a redeemer who will not leave us here. The Bible says he will not allow my soul to see corruption. Neither will he forsake his beloved one in Hades. He's not leaving us here. He's coming for us and the confidence that we have is that we are gallantly waiting for him to show but in the meantime these guys continue to do their stuff it is the time of the great deception they make it seem like it's nothing they make it seem like it's just I mean if you have a problem with it it's something wrong with you well I'm happy this is happening because every prophecy has to be fulfilled before Jesus comes let me say it this way because I know there are Bible scholars in the back. Bible prophecies have to be fulfilled in the order of their rendition before Jesus comes. So because when I said all prophecies have to be fulfilled, someone is like, but there are prophecies that will not be fulfilled until Jesus comes. Okay, so don't let's get twisted, okay? Well, what I'm saying is, there are certain prophecies that have to be fulfilled because Jesus says they have to be fulfilled before he comes. And one of such prophecies is that Satan will concord a wine that is called the wine of carousing, which is also called the wine of deception. And it will, it will serve it through the whore of Babylon for the kings of the earth to become intoxicated. And the Bible says that even the elect, some elect will be deceived. But Jesus says, do not be drunk with the wine of their carousing. And part of it is when they call that which is evil good and that which is good, they call it evil. The Bible says that which is not evil knowledge will be called science. That which does not even make sense. They will call it science. You see what I mean? They will call it science. Things like telling us that the earth is spinning. And we're like, but before television, the earth was not spinning though. 
Because the last time the academic world carried out any experiments to prove whether the earth is moving or not was in the 1800s, when it's, been, it's since been documented. You see, but it benefits some people to give us an impression of a world that is a virtual reality so that they can steal from us actual reality. So these things have to be fulfilled, and that is the reason why we're excited. But going back to what we've just read, the Bible says, God speaking, he says, I am coming to do battle the way that I have always done battle. And someone is like, okay, well, if God is going to do battle the way he's always done battle, and that includes hardening the heart of Pharaoh, which includes making the system become too confident in itself, and making the, 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 uh, the, 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 the messengers of Satan or, or the agents of darkness to feel very pompous within themselves, like they can say whatever they want and get away with it, that they can bully us into submission and get away with it. If they feel like that, okay, let God deal with it. It's not all. It's not that simple. You have a part to play as well. Because when God is doing battle, there are agencies that work for God. When God is doing battle, he is called the God of the army of angels. He is called Jehovah, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth. And the reason why he's called Jehovah Sabaoth is because he doesn't just come to battle by himself. There are powers in heaven that make sure that whenever God steps out of battle, they go ahead of him and they play their part. When God hardened the heart of Pharaoh and God says, I'm doing that because I want to be able to bring out my outstretched arm. Where did God bring out his outstretched arm? Where? God didn't bring out his arm until he got to, Red, until he got to the Red Sea. And he smashed that sea open and drowned Pharaoh in it. But before then, the angel of death was like, Lord, are you ready to move? I'll go ahead of you. Because you know that angel of the Lord, what, that angel of death, what is his other name? It's called the angel of the Lord. Because all things were made by God for God. Because we tend to think that, oh, that angel of death must be the assistant Satan. No. No, 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 no. God, the Bible says, all things were made by him for his pleasure. They are and, the, and were created. You understand what I mean? And so there are forces that have to go ahead of God. And God told the children of Israel, he was speaking to Moses in particular. He was introducing to Moses one of his agencies that, have, that goes ahead of them. And he says, you see, this one is, is different. He doesn't forgive. So be careful not to offend him. God was saying that because it's like, I'm coming behind, but this one is going ahead. You've had dealings with me. You know, sometimes you talk trash and I let you get away with it. All those people that complained the other day, I overlooked it. Some of them I dealt with, but some I kind of like had mercy on them. But you see this angel that is going ahead of you on this particular phase of this mission, he doesn't forgive anybody who misbehaves. Now, remember what happened to the people who misbehave after God told Moses that. They all perished. Every single one of them because the angel that was going ahead of God didn't have any mercy to give. He just had power to blow. You understand what I mean? And so that is the reason why it is important for us to know that God has come to do battle again so that you can anticipate his four living creatures. So that you can anticipate his angels who are holding the wind of destruction because they will come ahead of him. It is a guarantee. And when they come, how will they know to spare you? Let me tell you something, the only reason why the angel of death did not get to Goshen or did not take anyone from Goshen was because of the fact that they had inside information. Because they were told by Moses that they needed to slaughter a lamb, every single one of them, and put the blood upon their doorpost. You could have said, well, I mean, they could have said, well, this God told Moses that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so we're good. Because we're descendants of Abraham. He's not going to mess with us. He's not going to touch us. No. They could have said that and still perished. And God would be vindicated because he already said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So if I give knowledge and you don't embrace knowledge and something happens to you, it's on you, not on me. I told you what to do. And so in this situation, God is letting us know that it is not just enough for you to say, oh, I'm a born again Christian. It is not enough for you to say, Jesus died for me. 
It is not enough for you to say that I am being justified. It is not enough for you to say that his grace is sufficient for me. Yes, his grace is sufficient for you, but when we get to the day of battle, every single instruction becomes critical. Let me say this again. It was one of the things that I was reminded of by the Holy Spirit today. That you know, there are times wherein we keep enjoying the grace of God. Oh, the Bible says, you know, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And you keep doing this and doing that. And you just keep saying, oh, grace, 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 grace. But do you know that grace is not just called grace from heaven's perspective? You know what grace is called from heaven's perspective? It is called the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It says, may the grace, not just some random grace, not just, you know, anybody's grace. No, the Bible says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. So that means that grace is only available in Christ Jesus. And to be in Christ Jesus, there's one requirement. Obedience. Obedience, he says, because this is how he said it. He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. And who is he that was speaking? The word of God. So if the word of God is not in you and you are not in the word of God, then forget about that grace. You would only hear about it. But if you are going to experience that grace, you need to be what? You need to be covered by that blood. And the blood of Jesus, for it to be active in your life, you have to be in obedience. Go back to Israel. When Israel was in Egypt, staying in Goshen, if they had received the word of God that they did not know about two days prior, when Moses came, everything he told them was what he heard from God, but he didn't tell them about the blood of the land. That instruction came at the very last minute. And it was for a reason. Because God wanted to operate in the life of his children through exclusivity. If they had known from the time that Moses came that the angel of death will pass when he sees the blood, some Egyptians would have used the blood. Just in case. You know, because they're like, we've seen the frogs. We've seen the cricket. We've seen the darkness. Even the Nile turned into blood. I am not taking chances. Slaughter me a lamb. And someone says, but that wouldn't be so much of a problem. <laughs> I'll tell you why it is a problem. And that leads to the next announcement from the courts of heaven. But let me tell you why it's a problem. The Egyptians did not really keep animals. They hated animals. And that was the reason why they banished the children of Israel to Goshen. It's in your Bible. When they started to multiply and Pharaoh heard about it, it was like, uh, we can't keep these people here. He said, let them be given Goshen because of their animals. We don't want no animals here. Send the animals to Goshen. So if the word had gotten out, that it was the blood of the lamb that will save the lives of men. The ones who had money, who had power and influence, would have purchased all the lamb, and the ones that need to be saved will be left with nothing. And that is the reason why what will save us in the times that we're in is not public information. It only will be by the Holy Spirit. 
you need to have developed attentiveness to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, he says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. He was talking about the rock of personal revelation. Things that are not revealed by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit. So when the angels of the Lord are crying out and the prophet of the Lord is privileged to hearing what they are saying and what they are complaining about or what they are crying about is that we are not being attacked. Attentive. It is a genuine concern because if we do not hear the specific instructions of the times that we are in, we will not know where to put the blood. The Lord is here to do battle the way he has always done battle. He is still the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. His boys will not let him go to battle alone. They go ahead of him and some of them, once they move, they don't know how to stop unless there is a seal that is already coded into the program for them to avoid. We saw one of them in Exodus, but in Revelations, how many of them did we see? There are four of them of the same potency. Let me say that again because we need to understand what's going on. There was one angel of death that took Egypt out. But now that Egypt has gone to reinforce itself by bringing in the power of Sodom. Can we see the power of Sodom around us? All of this same-sex campaign that is going on, that is Sodom. Can we see the power of Babylon? The new world order. When the world nations are destroying the sovereignty of individual nations so that they can become one again. In fact, they call themselves one. I tell you, the word UN is a French word, which means one. Uh, in French, means one. From all indications, we know that they are trying to revive Babylon. Not trying to. Babylon is here again. And so God is not leaving anything to chance because he is the almighty. He knows the end from the beginning. And so this time around, there's not just one angel, but the Bible says that there are four of them and they actually have a moderator, making five. There is an angel that moderates their activities. He's there in the book of Revelations. The Bible says, and the Lord said to his angel to go and tell the four angels that are holding the winds of destruction at the corners of the earth and say to them not to move until there is another confirmation that comes in that all of the saints have been sealed. And why is God so concerned about the saints being sealed? Because he knew those people. Because he knows them. They left heaven a long time ago with one instruction. And they have not been updated. All they know is that once they release us from here, we're taking lives. We're wiping the system clean. That is all we're going to do. So if anything is going to remain, it has to access. It has to be because there is something accessing built-in information into those angels. And that is the reason why the Lord said to that angel who is the moderator, please go and tell your friends. I know they're eager to clean the slate. Because, let me tell you, Jesus told us the reason why those boys are so eager to destroy everything. Jesus says, because they were asking him, when would all these things be? <laughs> he was like, when the cup of wickedness is full. And you know why? You see, because the angels that are holding the four winds of the earth, where they're at, they see what's going on. But the moment the cup of wickedness is full and it starts to come to their feet, they swing into action. That is their cue. That is the alarm. When the wickedness gets to them. Now, we're beginning to see wickednesses get into places that it shouldn't get to. You have so-called church organizations now who are celebrating rebellion against the word of God. And you still don't think that the cup of wickedness is already overflowing? It is overflowing. But the good news is this, we have been provisioned for, but the only way by which we are going to make it is if we recognize that there is a need to hear every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Imagine if you slept all day on the day that Moses says, go guys, go put blood on your doorpost. And you, you turned off your phone and you had already blocked your neighbor so that, you know, when the time comes for you to be warned, the one who was closest to you, who's supposed to warn you, you've already blocked them. They don't have a way of talking to you. 
Imagine what would have happened to what would happen to a person like that. They would have missed that final instruction. Do you know the Bible says that as soon as, especially as you see the day approaching, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Why is that so? If you read on, it lets you know that that is how we are going to be equipped against contempt. I already said it's a list of the next instructions. I'm going to touch on the next instruction very quickly. Come with me to Matthew chapter 7. There is, a, there is a hidden instruction there. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. The Bible says, many will say to me in that day. <laughs> what day? The day that the Lord does battle. The day that the four angels of destruction are released. The day when judgment comes upon the earth. The day that you and I get redeemed. The day that we get trans. Figured. In that same day, the Jesus says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you will practice lawlessness. The Lord says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What is the law? What is the law that Jesus is talking about? You can read the rest of it on your own, but for the sake of time, I'm going to tell you what the law is. The law that Jesus is talking about is the law of kindness. He said to those people, depart from me. I do not know you, even though they were miracle workers. Some of them healed the sick. In fact, some of them raised the dead in his name. But guess what? They showed no kindness. They only demonstrated power. It is easy for you to demonstrate power. But can you show kindness? Jesus said to the other party of people that same day, the ones who received the commendation, he says, friends, please come close. I've been waiting for you. I've actually been on a fast since I left the earth. I've not had wine. The Bible says, Jesus says, he will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until he receives us into the kingdom. He says to those people, he says, I've been fasting. Come close. Let us break this fast, guys. I've been waiting for y'all. And they were like, but the, the general overseer and the bishop of our denomination just got kicked down. The guy who preached at the crusade where I got saved just got thrown out. The one whose book I read to deliver me from fear, just got banished from the gates of your kingdom. Why are you now calling me? Are you playing with me? Are you pulling my legs? You see, because the miracle workers did not make it in. And so when these other guys were called, they were baffled and they were like, why us? And Jesus says, you, I mean you for real, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. You are the ones who knew the law. The law of kindness is simply love in operation. The angels of the Lord are crying because they want to go to battle with us. But we have to be in sync with the host of heaven. You cannot go to battle with a people that cannot communicate with you because you're not paying attention. They have their communicating devices and they're trying to talk to us, but we're not paying attention. We're too occupied by what things people do to us. We're too occupied by what things people have failed to do for us. The entitlement culture is getting the better of us and the materialism in the world is choking our frequency up so we cannot hear what the Lord is saying through the ministry of his angels. And the angels are saying, not only can they not hear us, but they are also not oscillating at the same frequency as we are. And the Bible says two shall not walk together unless they be in agreement. The angels of the Lord are ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation and they're only going to be able to go to battle with you if you also are a ministering spirit to your brother and to your sister. If we cannot serve one another then we cannot fight alongside with the angels because the angels are serving spirits. They are ministering spirits 
to those who are heirs of salvation with Christ Jesus. Have you not read where it was written in 1 Peter chapter 3 when the Lord said, Husbands, husbands, serve your wives as though they are heirs of salvation as well as you are. Let me say that again. The Bible says, husbands, serve your wives as though they also are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. You know what that means? Everyone who is an heir of salvation gets to enjoy all of what Jesus enjoys. So everything that you do for them, you do for Jesus. That was why Jesus says, whatsoever you do to the least of the brethren, you do unto me. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, I want you to recognize that even though your wife might be the weaker vessel, you need to treat her as though she is Christ. Whatever you will not do to Christ, don't do to her. Because she is a co-heir. And so if you are not able to serve her, the Bible says you will not have what God has promised. In fact, I think there's a translation that says, if you don't, your prayers may be hindered. Ah, look at that. The, the, the New King James Bible. What does he say? Is, is that first Peter chapter there, 3 verse 7? He says, husbands likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Let me tell you something. The angels of the Lord... They minister to us, how? As heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. We are about to go to battle, the very final battle, the last battle of Armageddon. And here we are knowing fully well that we cannot go to this battle alone because that would be anti-prophecy. Because the Bible says Jesus is coming with a myriad of his saints. We already know Jesus does not travel alone. Because he is the Lord of hosts, so he's coming with myriads and myriads of his angels. And once they get close enough, they will pick up the ones who are already dead in Christ. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first and they will be joined to meet with him. So the army will grow larger. And those of us who are on the ground will be caught up to meet with him. And you will only be caught up to meet with him if you are of the same kind as the ones who are coming. Because the Bible says where the body is, there the eagles will gather. And so if you're not of the same regiment, it's not going to happen. It is not rocket science. It is very simple. Two things that I have been made aware of so far, I share with you. You need attentiveness to what the angels are saying. And what are they saying? They are only messengers. So basically they are saying what your heavenly father is saying. And so you need to be able to listen even when you're working listen. Even when you're serving other people, still listen. No matter what it is that you're doing, keep pinging the Holy Spirit in your heart for what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches. And don't just hear and be a hearer only, deceiving yourself, thinking you're going to go and join the angels and the army that is coming, but be doers of what you are hearing because every one of us who hears what the Spirit is saying in the times we're in will hear of how you can better serve Chris, how you can better serve Josephine because that is what angels do and you need to start to oscillate at the frequency of ministering spirits by you yourself becoming a minister to other people. Not to have the title minister and so I am minister Moses and I am here to be minister too because that's what a lot of people say when they say they're minister they're commanding your, mini, your, your, your service. You introduce yourself by your service to other people. I want you to show up at church Barbara, I want you to show up, and as soon as you show up, Patricia will just know that you have been praying for her. The Bible says deep calls unto deep. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. And so if you pray well enough for others, they will know. Because God will reveal to them where you have been. For what is done in secret, the Bible says the Lord reveals and he rewards in the open. And so I want to encourage you, let us take heed to these two things that have come to us. It's been a while since we last had a prophetic update of this sort to the church. But here it is. Be attentive. Be kind. Do the things that the angels do. Be a ministering spirit to what? Those, those who will inherit salvation. 
I did that ministry spirit sent forth to minister to those who inherit salvation. Okay, I'm going to give you a third one because I'm really excited. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. Oh yes, thank you. Hallelujah. Prabobos Migidionda. Jesus. You know, somebody encouraged me the other day. And it was Antoine. He said that the word, there are times when a pastor is speaking and then he said prophet. And he says he speaks to our spirits. That got me very excited. Because I remember the day the Lord told me that what he was sending me to go and tell the people was not for their ears, it was for their spirits. Uh, I was like, uh, I don't know. How does that even work again? And he said to me, he says, deep calls to deep. He says, what I have for them that I've put in you is not for this place. Because they have to see and go through certain things to be able to appreciate it. He said, but it is for their spirits. Go give them a heads up. You understand what I mean? And I tell you what, it was very apparent that I was speaking to spirits that day because everybody was just looking at me. People were falling asleep and Bibles were falling. Because nobody really knew what I was saying. Even myself, I felt like I was speaking in tongues. And I was there. It was one of the most, it was one of the toughest messages that I ever preached. You know when you're preaching to people and you already know that? Yeah, they don't know. And not only am I concerned about the people, I was already anticipating the drill that I would get from my wife. Because she'd be like, Professor... What was that about? Yeah, you were just, you were, you were talking to yourself. Because what was all that illustration and all of this stuff about, you know? Yeah, because she would give it to me. She's my number one feedback review specialist. So I was there and I'm like, oh, it's over. Tonight, I will hear it. Because these people, no one's getting it. But then I remember that the Lord said to me, deep calls unto deep. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to run with that. And you know what? After a while, I started to receive updates. People would be telling me stuff. Like they had a dream and I was in it. And I'm like, okay, it's getting interesting. If this is the outcome of that boring meeting, I'll take it. You understand? Because all I strive for is not relevance as much as effectiveness. You know, people might take me to be relevant from their perspective in terms of relatability, but am I effective from heaven's perspective as one who has been sent to serve others? You understand what I mean? Revelations 21, 3. And before I get that warning message, let's quickly read it. The Bible says, Behold, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, I want you to tell yourself that the things that you need to hear are not being whispered. They are coming through a loud voice. You see what I mean? Because of the fact that... Hmm, the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. You need to tame the animal within. Otherwise, it will claim ignorance. It will say, I didn't know. I didn't hear. You know how many people are like, oh, I just wish God would speak to me like he speaks to Moses. And it's like, uh, but God is speaking. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord speaks expressly. The onus is on you to tune out the noise so that you can hear. Do you know that there is 96.5 FM? Is that the born again FM or the unborn again one? Whichever one is the born again one. I know there's an FM that is kind of like for Christian music. I don't listen to the radio. But let's just say 91.2, random, okay? Say that again? 91.5. Is that victory? No, no, they kicked me out of that radio station. So what, find another one. 101.7. That's the fish. Oh, yeah, we're fishers of men. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You all forgot, you know, that I used to be on 91.5? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but because I was, uh, anyway, story for another day. So, 104.7 is in this room right now, but can you hear it? No, for you to hear it, you need to tune in. You understand what I mean? And then you need to eliminate the noise because that's the process of tuning in. M tuning in, like I told you once before, is actually more of tuning out. Because the moment you switch on that radio, there is noise. Shh. That noise includes 91.5. It includes 106 point whatever. All of them are there. And so what you're doing is you're eliminating the ones that you do not want. And that is the reason why you need to eliminate the voice of mammon. Because money is always talking to you. 
You need to eliminate the voice of the system because the system is always speaking to you. You need to eliminate, eliminate the voice of pride because pride, the Bible says the pride of life is, see, the pride of life, the way it talks to you is it keeps reminding you of your own significance and that is the reason why you fight to keep your prominence in that relationship that you're in whereas you need to listen to the voice of love that teaches you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up. The Bible says a loud voice is saying, Saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The angels of the Lord are so baffled by how nonchalant we have become with the privilege that we have. They look at us and they see a people that are not even preparing to receive the Lord of hosts. What is this all about is that God wants to come and live here. What am I doing about it? You don't have to build him a house because he's coming to live in a house that is not built by man and he's even bringing one for you. So how do you prepare? It's very simple. The way you prepare is you need to come to a point wherein your anticipation becomes celebration. Where in every day you're just full of joy. I've been through some of the most challenging times recently. And yet, even when I'm trying to be serious-minded about serious issues, I find myself laughing in the Holy Ghost. And I've had to tell myself, come on, be serious. And my spirit is like, I am really serious. Jesus is so close. You understand what I mean? And so the thing is, your anticipation has to be celebration it needs to become joy you see because when your emotions are not involved you are not fully serving him with your heart and soul i'm not saying be emotional about your service and just be in the, your emotions no i'm saying be in the spirit to the point where even your emotions get in line emotions are great as long as they're not leading but they have to be following and so the last thing the last update is this Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. I pray for you today in the mighty name of Jesus. That you will be in the spirit. And not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Your flesh wants to worry, but your spirit wants to celebrate. I pray that you will be in the spirit. Your spirit longs for a word from heaven. But your flesh wants to continue to analyze gossip. I pray for you today then in the mighty name of Jesus. While other people are running out of oil, you will continue to be in the press, juicing out more oil of the anointing. So that regardless of what happens, the Bible says he is coming. Not in the morning, not at night, but the Bible says in the evening he will bring the light. And so it's not going to be all dark until he comes. Because in the evening, Zechariah chapter 14, the Bible says he brings the light. I pray for you that you will have oil enough to last that evening until he comes. Rejoice, my beloved, I say again. Rejoice. Let us go ahead and break bread today. Hallelujah. Okay, I don't want somebody to feel like this is not communion house. Let's break bread with Genesis chapter 13. We took a break on Saturday. We went to the New Testament to break bread, but we're back to the Old Testament. I missed it already. Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. We're going to break bread with this scripture. The Bible says, and so Abraham, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 13 verse 4. The Bible says, if I let's read from verse, uh, let's quickly read from verse 2. Abraham was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the house of God to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of of the Lord. As we break bread today, I pray for you that you will receive an activation of your first love. The Bible says Abraham went to the place where he had once encountered the Lord. And it's like, I know once I get to Bethel, the Lord will be there. Because Bethel means the house of God. That as you break bread today, that your spiritual compass or the compass of your spirit will be dusted 
from where it's been and cleaned so that once again you can navigate your place into intimacy. Navigate your, your heart into intimacy with God because you can no longer be without his voice. You can no longer be without the aroma of Bethel. And so as, as Abraham woke up, and the Bible says he went, he got up from between Bethel and Ai. That's where, we, where we're at. You know that Ai, Ai, Ai. It means what? A place of ruins. And so we have been caught between the world and the Lord. The world is becoming a ruin, a pile of ruin. It's about to be done away with. So don't just stay in the middle between Ai and Bethel. Return to Bethel. Seek the Lord and you will hear him. Seek him and you will find him. Call upon him and he will answer you. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that as I speak from my deep, you will receive in your deep deep the instructions and righteousness for your feet to be quickened unto righteousness and purity that you may find that closeness again that you may have lost that once again intimacy will be your bread in the morning intimacy will be your bread in the afternoon and intimacy with the, with the lord will be your bread in the evening that you will not be missing intimacy with the lord you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. And just celebrate because I just heard that someone here has just been delivered of not being able to press into the presence of God. So you go home today and it will seem as if the Lord's been waiting for you. You dive into your bed and you will not sleep or pray. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Eat of the Lord's body, drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty. So that's it. Um, and very quickly before we go, um, uh, Alan is going to come and say a blessing over the offering. But before that, I just want to encourage us that um, let not your heart sorrow over the world. Jesus says, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for these ones. You see, because you need to start to build the stamina now. The stamina. The stamina. A lot of decadence has happened in the world that is about to be known. But build the stamina so that you're not drawn. Remember what the Lord told us, I think September last year, just before the queen passed away. The, the angel of the Lord was in this place between those two cameras. And he said to me, he said, tell them that their hearts should not love the world. Because anything that you love in the world, as the judgment of the Lord comes upon them, if you are still in love with it, you will feel the heartbreak. And uh, with the heartbreak, it's not that easy to rejoice. And so you want to be ready to not mind whatever is going on and only be mindful of heaven. I leave you this charge in the mighty name of the Lord. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will raise your hand and they will not be weak. That you will bend the knee and they will not bleed. That you will call upon the Lord and you will not lose your voice. That you will lift up your eyes and you will not miss the angels. You will look up at night and you will see the signs that the stars are communicating. And in the daytime as the sun shines, even your body will know that which the Lord is saying unto his beloved. You will not be deaf nor dumb, but you will hear and you will speak in righteousness and truth of the coming of the Lord. Rejoice again. I say rejoice. God bless you. I'll see you on Saturday. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Come on, somebody. Praise God. The given details on the screen. Anyone need an envelope, you can come see me right here. It'll be here in the offering, offering basket as we're preparing our tithes and offerings. Let us be reminded of the charge given us that the master is coming and he, he's paying out. He's paying out. Let us be a part of what the Lord is doing in this house. Let it show in our giving and our obedience being light on our feet to what we know the Lord has placed on our hearts in partnership. And even as it was declared over us that we be intent on even going before the Lord, Lord, how have you called me to partner at this house? Hallelujah. With our offerings prepared, Father, we give you praise. For indeed, you give seed to the sower. We thank you, O oh God, for this time of preparation, 
O God, of further equipping. How merciful you are, O God. Lord, we thank you that you have seen fit to speak to us plainly tonight. And Lord, as you have moved in our hearts, Lord, let these offerings unto you be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. amen. And so be it. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. Come on, somebody. Tomorrow, don't forget, we're back at it again. Instagram, live, second watch. What was that, sir? And Zoom, that's right. We got the Zoom link as well. I want to give us the um, insight now into what we're doing tomorrow. We're going to be interceding, okay, for the body. And uh, us at Communion House, we're going to be interceding, interceding for this group in particular as well because we know that the Lord has called us uh, to many, okay? So we just want to press into this instruction that we have received tonight, and we will be going forward in that. So get your scriptures prepared because we're going to be making declarations, uh, and we're going to go from there. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we'll be back as well Saturday. And I actually, I just want to highlight the men here. We had such a great time last night. Uh, come on. Let's, let's celebrate. We had such a great time last night at Men's Monday. Uh, if you haven't been plugged in with us yet, please come and, and commune with us and really tap into that fellowship. You know, we just get to enjoy a different side of each other when we are uh, breaking bread. So I just want to encourage the brothers here. If you have not been a part of that yet, come see me and we'll go from there. All righty. Everyone have a blessed night.